I'll take it away. Well, good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to our session uh, for this year's AC Transit ASUC uh, Parking and Transportation Class Pass Forum. Uh, we're glad that you guys are here today uh, as our guest in, you know, making sure that we have, you know, the conversation around um, making sure that we've got transit uh, available for our students and what that vision may look like in the near future. Um, it's to our understanding that that over the last 390 plus days that we've seen a lot of changes, uh, mainly because of the pandemic, but also is an opportunity for our student body uh, to which that they've provided, um, you know, uh, not only managed to get the class pass ballot measure uh, approved last April, but to at least lay a groundwork in a foundation uh, for effective transit, especially since uh, our students will be having that expectation of coming back uh, in the fall. And so today we have here um, for myself, uh, you know, we'll do quick introductions. Myself, my name is David Sorrell, I'm the Transportation Demand Management Administrator for the campus. I oversee our class mass committee group. Uh, with us on today's call, um, that will be our moderator, is Erica Ruiz, who's our senior intern, um, who's been in charge of engagement. Uh, Blair Zhang, who's also our intern in been in charge of planning uh, as well as transportation demand management. So Erica, would you like to just begin, please? Yes, um, good evening and hello. My name is Erica Reese and as Dave said, I'm one of the interns for the UC Berkeley Parking and Transportation. And at first I would just like to welcome you all to the AC Transit Forum today. In previous years, we hosted the forum on Sproul Plaza and there's usually a large AC Transit bus to engage with. Um, however, with recent unprecedented events, we still wanted to have an event hosted virtually where students have the opportunity to engage with AC Transit and the class pass. And I would just like to take a moment to introduce our amazing um, panelists from AC Transit. Um, first, we are joined by Jean Walsh, who was elected recently in 2020 to serve War II. Um, previously, she directed community outreach and government relations for Bagel's Bike Share and signed up more than 500 low income residents um, to discounted pricing programs. Prior to that, Ms. Walsh led communications and public outreach for the City of San Francisco Department of the Environment and Public Utilities Commission, promoting environmental and environmental initiatives and critical infrastructure programs and um, she holds a master's degrees um, in planning from MIT and a bachelor's degree from the University of Colorado Boulder and um, she's active in Trans Bay Coalition, East Bay Transit Riders Union and Bike East Bay and other grassroots advocacy programs working to improve Bay Area transportation. Um, she is also president of the Longfellow Community Association. Um, an interesting fact about Jean Walsh is that she's been car free since 2004. Kudos to Eugene. And she enjoys getting um, around on foot, bike, scooter, and public transit. And she also believes Bay Area, Bay Area residents deserve a seamless transportation um, network that is fast, frequent, affordable, pleasant, and easy to use. And um, moving on, we also have joining us Robert um, Del Rosario, who's the Director of Service Development and Planning for AC Transit. As an undergrad student at Cal, he has interned at AC Transit and worked on developing the district's um, street furniture program. He also worked on the information campaign to initiate the class pads program in 1998. Robert is a resident nearby Albany and serves on the City Transportation's Commission, which oversees transportation initiatives, including certain aspects of transportation in the UC villages. And then we also joining us have Derek Calhoun, who is a director of transportation for AC Transit. He has over 30 experiences in transportation and before joining us um, in AC Transit in 2016, he has worked in the private um, sector as a regional vice president for MB Transportation and School Bus Transportation as senior manager for first student. 
His years of experience has given him a strong financial acumen, leadership, customer-driven team, and team-oriented experience. Derek's team-first philosophy has helped AC Transit to build a strong transportation presence in the region. And then finally joining us, we have Chris Andrick, who is the Chief Financial Officer as the Amida AC Transit um, District. Chris has he started his career in public transit as MTA New York City Transit in the Capital Budget Department, where he worked for five years. In 2011, Chris started as HU Transit first in Capital Planning and Grants Department and eventually working his way up to his current position as Chief Financial Officer. As CFO, Chris leads several functions for AC Transit, Operating Budget, Capital Budget and Grants, and Procurements, Treasurer, and some more. Chris is a graduate of Drexel University, Stanford University, and Hunter College, and all those people will be our panelists today, and we are very excited to have them. Again, thank you all for joining us today, and we'll have plenty of time to answer questions at the end of the forum, but in the meantime, please feel free to leave comments in the chat, and we'll get our best to get back to you. Um, with that, now I will leave on to, um, I'll stop sharing my screen and let AC Transit um, start sharing the slides. All right, so first and foremost, we will start with, uh, I believe we can start with Chris. Let's get you set up here. Uh, okay, Chris, take it away. So uh, I think, um, yeah, Gene is, is starting the uh, the, the slides today. Okay, thanks. <laughs> Great. Yeah, well, thank you so much. Uh, good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. And thank you to Dave and Erica and Blair and everyone who organized this event tonight. I'm so excited to be here. Uh, I am Jean Walsh and I am your representative. If you live in Berkeley, I am your representative on the AC Transit Board of Directors. Um, excuse me, there's a car going by. Um, I'm one of the newest board members. Uh, I was just elected in November. So if you voted in November, you probably saw my name on the ballot. You hopefully voted for me, um, but here I am and I am a newly elected member of the, of the board. And I'll just give a pitch for our, our meetings, which are every second and fourth Wednesday of the month. We have one next Wednesday at 5 p.m. This is, they're open to the public. This is your chance to come and learn and see what's going on with AC Transit. Give us your input, give us your feedback, give us your ideas, suggestions, complaints. We wanna hear it all. We welcome public participation in our board meetings. So why did I run for office to be on the board of directors for AC Transit? Well, first of all, as, as it was mentioned, I have been car free since 2004, excuse me. I moved out with my freshly minted uh, urban planning degree from, from Boston. And I left my car behind and I would, thought I would buy one when I got here. And 17 years later, I never did buy a car. So I get around on my bike, on AC Transit, on BART. I use bike share, I use scooters, I use the occasional Lyft and Uber. I sometimes rent a get around or a gig. So I'm using all of the different modes to get around. And as you know, if you're car free, this is what you kind of have to do. You have to patch it together to get around the Bay Area. And, and make it work. Um, so on a, on a personal note, that's, that's why I wanna make transit better uh, for people like myself who, who rely on the bus. Um, but on a, on a bigger picture level, really public transportation is at the intersection of some of the most pressing problems of our time. Uh, for, for one, climate change. Uh, I'll just go ahead and call it what it is. It's climate emergency and we're in the middle of it. If you were here last summer, you remember the orange skies that we woke up to that day because of the wildfires. There's droughts. We're, we're in the middle of climate change and there's no denying it. And guess what? One of the biggest contributors to climate change is greenhouse gas emissions that come from the transportation sector, meaning cars. So it really is important that we get people out of cars and onto public transportation if we're gonna get through this crisis. Um, another thing, a vision zero, you know, city are aiming to have zero traffic deaths. Well, guess what? We're a long way from that. I had to look up this number because I thought it was 38,000 uh, traffic deaths each year that we have hit in the United States, but it's actually 42,000 people have died in traffic deaths. Uh, and that's an 8% increase since last year. Um, this was when we were in shelter in place. We weren't supposed to be even leaving our house and, and yet traffic deaths are up. So we have a culture of a, a car culture that is really, you know, killing us, literally. Uh, 
another thing is the housing crisis. We all know that people are, are displaced. They're moving further and further out of the city to places where transit is non-existent, pushing them into longer and longer commutes and more and more traffic congestion. And then finally, racial justice. The trial of Derek Chauvin is happening right now. Um, this killing of George Floyd led to this national reckoning that we have a lot of work to do around racial justice and transportation is connected to that. If you think about the highways that were built that devastated black and brown communities, tore, tore apart neighborhoods and disconnected people from their communities and that's still happening today. So um, if you also look at the people who are riding AC transit buses, 75% people of color. So when you make the bus better, you improve people's lives and it's all connected. So uh, what, what I think is that, you know, public transportation really is a means to economic opportunity, cleaner air, healthier communities, uh, more justice and, and, and a better world. And that's really the big picture why I wanted to be part of this. So tonight I am going to share a few facts and figures about AC Transit. And uh, then I'm gonna turn it over to our capable staff that, that we introduced who have worked really hard on this presentation. I'm so glad we're able to do this together and thank them for their work as well. So we can move to the next slide. There we go. All right, so AC, what does AC stand for? Alameda Contra Costa Transit. Uh, we are, you can see the green area. We span from all the way up north past Richmond, all the way down south to Fremont, Fremont a big chunk of the East Bay uh, that we cover. And that is, um, what was my notes on that? How many people do we serve? Millions of people. Um, okay, next slide. Yeah, 364 square miles. Um, okay, so you can see the numbers here. We, we serve a lot of people. Um, before the pandemic, 15,000 people were riding the Trans Bay buses across into the city. I was one of them. I was on the F bus, love the F bus. Um, but we are one of the 27 different Bay Area transit agencies. We connect to BART, we connect to Amtrak, we connect to the ferry. Um, we're one of the big players in public transportation in, in the Bay Area region. Next slide. And thanks to the riders at UC Berkeley and the class pass program, we have a lot of riders from your program. And so thank you so much for taking the bus. Your choices matter. Your transportation decisions are making the planet a better place and our communities a better place to live. So thank you for, for riding AC Transit. Awesome. So in the midst of a global pandemic, we have been hard at work. First of all, our operators and our mechanics and all of the people involved in, in making the bus go have been working day in, day out to keep transit moving throughout the pandemic, to carry essential workers to their jobs. And while many of us have been sheltering in place, the buses have still been running, the operators have still been driving, and essential workers have still been riding that bus to, to get around. Um, so thank you for your service, all of you bus operators and mechanics and everybody who's working at AC Transit. Um, and in addition to that, we've managed to launch the Tempo BRT, Bus Rapid Transit Line. I don't know if you've ha had a chance to ride it. It's a nine and a half mile line that runs from San Leandro all the way to Oakland. And it's really cool. It has dedicated lanes so the bus can whiz past traffic. It has really nice stations with canopies and places to sit. Um, you can buy your ticket before you get on the bus, which speeds boarding. It's really fancy and it's really first in the in the whole area that, we, that we've done something like this. So it's, it's very exciting that we have this bus rapid transit on the tempo line. We've also launched a new app. I encourage you to download it. The icon is on your screen. It's the AC Transit official app. You can pay with your, your phone. If you don't have your clipper and you don't have cash, you can pay with your phone. And uh, we also redesigned our website. If you know anything about web design, it's a big deal to take a website and make a brand new one out of it. So we did that. So check it out. A lot of great information there. We won employer of the year. And we also renovated our customer service center. So a lot of big changes happening behind the scenes during the pandemic. Next slide. All right, and here's our all-star cast that I'm going to turn it over to next. We already did the introductions, but just so you know, these folks are very high up in the organization. They are really making AC Transit work and they've really put a lot of time into this presentation and they have a lot of great information to share. So I'll turn it over to the team. Thank you. All right, um, 
Good evening, Derek Calhoun, uh, Director of Transportation for AC Transit. Uh, first off, I'd just like to, on behalf of AC Transit, hope that all of you and your families are safe during this pandemic. Uh, I'm so excited to uh, announce some of the safety measures that AC Transit has put in place to make your ride safe. Um, in, in accordance with the state and county mandates, AC Transit took a very proactive approach to keep our operators and riders safe. Here are some of the important initiatives that uh, we've implemented to create a safe environment for everyone that rides AC Transit. First, um, as our buses come back to the yard at the end of the day, um, they're clean and disinfected daily, especially around the high touch point uh, areas on the bus. Also, all of our buses are fogged each day with uh, a disinfectant. We increased our bus filtration uh, system, which has helped to ensure the least amount of exposure to particulates in the air. Our operators currently use uh, the positive airflow ventilation procedure that we implemented during the COVID-19 pandemic. This procedure uh, requires all windows to be closed. Um, the operators turn on the heat and ventilation or, uh, and air conditioning or the HVAC on the coach. And then they lift the rear uh, roof hatch, which uh, is placed in a full open position. This also pushes the particulates uh, through the roof hatch. Uh, we've continued to keep our riders safe by equipping our buses with masks and hand sanitizers. AC Transit has also installed signage on each bus to explain to our riders all of our safety requirements ranging from six foot distancing requirements all the way to uh, face coverings. Next slide. Our maintenance department created a COVID-19 <laughs> protective shield for each bus. Uh, the shield en encloses the operator for the protection from the spread of COVID-19. It's flexible enough to open and close while riders are boarding and disembarking. The normal passenger limit uh, line that uh, is the yellow line in front of the bus as you enter the bus has been extended uh, to meet the COVID-19 required distancing between the operators and the riders. AC Transit has implemented a, uh, a rider load information application, which uses cellular data uh, to enable the rider uh, capacity features uh, on our apps. Now this feature is available on our ACT real time. This allows riders to view low capacities with fewer seats due to social distancing requirements knowing uh, the bus capacity levels is becoming critically important to all of our riders and it's helped through this pandemic. At AC Transit, we have adhered to, our, to the CDC requirements on load uh, capacities and we have continued to follow procedures when uh, load capacities has also been reached on all of our buses. Our rider capacity requirements for a 40 foot coach is 10 riders. Our 45 foot MCI coaches is 12 riders. Our 60 foot Arctic buses is 16. And in our 43 foot uh, double deckers, we can uh, have 24 riders. Operators um, will contact our operations control center as soon as they get to capacity. And then our co control center will send out an additional bus to help with uh, any overcrowding that we may encounter. Next slide. On March the 1st, um, AC Transit began piloting an all-door boarding program on two of our bus lines, the 51B and the Route 6, which most, most of you are probably familiar with. Uh, this allows our riders with clipper cards to now board at the back of the bus to minimize crowds in front of the bus. So far, we've uh, experienced very positive results. Uh, there has been less time uh, on the bus and it's been uh, more reliable with our service as well. And in closing, uh, responding to the COVID-19 pandemic took the entire AC Transit team to work together with one coordinated response. And that response is to put our riders and our operators in the safest possible environment through this pandemic. And now I wanna turn the presentation over to Mr. Chris Andrzejczak. Chris. Thank you, Derek. Uh Good evening, uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, this is Chris Andrzejczak. I'm the 
uh, Chief Financial Officer of AC Transit, as uh, was introduced before. I'm just going to give you a very high-level overview of our financial condition and how we'll be getting through the, the pandemic. Next slide, please. So the, the AC Transit was in a pretty good financial position coming into the pandemic. Uh, we had good ridership. Uh, our fare box revenues were doing well. Um, sales taxes, all these things that, that fund the agency were uh, doing pretty well. Uh, one thing to note here is that AC Transit, uh, fortunately, is, has a, a diverse base of revenues. And uh, you know, what that means for us is we have property taxes, we have sales taxes, we have uh, bridge toll revenues, we, we have a, a mix of things, fare box revenues that fund our agency. So during the pandemic, some of these things were uh, affected uh, more than other uh, more than other sources. And so we were, we, you know, we're in a little bit better space than some of the other agencies like listed here, Golden Gate Transit, BART, Caltrain, that really depend on uh, fare box revenues on, you know, people paying their fare. Uh, and that chart on the right uh, is really just meant to show that, you know, that, that there's a bunch of agencies, this is nine of them in, in the region, eight, not eight, region, eight, eight transit agencies in the region. And that they, uh, you know, we all have different uh, funding sources, different revenue mixes. And so we've all been affected a little bit differently during the pandemic. Next slide. So how do we make it up to this point? So uh, fortunately for public transit agencies across the country, um, the federal government has stepped in and provided supplemental operating funds. Uh, the first of which was the CARES Act. I'm not gonna try and say out these uh, acronyms uh, that was early on in the pandemic. Um, we received uh, about $114 million from that uh, funding source. Uh, it was allocated in about June. Uh, some of that was used in our prior fiscal year. Uh, AC Transit has a fiscal year that runs from July to June, so six months offset from the actual calendar year. Uh, so, you know, we, we used 30 million of that to fill in uh, losses, revenue losses that we experienced in the very beginning of the pandemic. Uh, $84 million is filling in revenue losses that we are seeing uh, in this current fiscal year, uh, you know, right now, basically. Uh, so then, you know, looking forward, the economy is not going to be back to normal uh, by July of this year when our new fiscal year starts. So uh, again, fortunately, there was a second uh, pandemic uh, stimulus act from the federal government, the CARISA, C-R-R-S-A Act. Uh, and that was passed, uh, I think, the very beginning of January. Um, and that is providing uh, AC Transit with $56 million. That will be used to uh, sort of rescue or fill in the, uh, the revenue losses we're projecting for this coming fiscal year, again, starting in, in July. Uh, next slide. So, you know, looking forward uh, towards next fiscal year and, and beyond, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of uncertainty as to how things are going to go. Uh, you know, fortunately, uh, um, vaccines are, are being distributed, people are getting them. Um, the state feels that it's, uh, you know, good enough to get out of the uh, color tiers uh, by the middle of June, uh, but that doesn't mean everything goes back to exactly the way it was before the pandemic. Um, certainly, you know, we've done a lot to try and make people feel comfortable getting on the bus, but you know that, that really is a decision that's up to them. So we don't expect everyone to immediately sort of snap back to their old habits. I think it's gonna take a little while, uh, particularly trans, our Transbay ridership, our more of our commuter ridership. Um, it, it could take a long while. Everybody's sort of used to working from home. It sounds, you know, we're hearing that that's going to be at least partially available at a lot of places. So, you know, it might take a little while for our Transbay ridership to come back. Uh, and then just from a, an employment standpoint, looking at this, you know, compared to other recessions in the past, certainly this is different, but, you know, these things uh, can take a little while to, to get us back. So it could be a, a couple of years before we get back to the employment levels of before the pandemic. Next slide. So as we look forward and we, you know, we start to look at, well, can we restore some of the service uh, that we had to cut during the pandemic? We, we need to sort of look beyond uh, the federal stimulus funds that we're getting. Um, there was a third stimulus act that was just passed, the American Recovery Plan. Uh, we don't know how much we're going to be getting from that. That's a discussion that's happening at the regional level right now. Um, 
but that will, you know, that will be funding for this coming fiscal year or, or and beyond, most likely, um, but not forever. So, you know, we need to make sure that the amount of service that we can provide, that we can pay for, is going to match the amount of funding that we'll have, you know, sort of once we get past these uh, one-time funding supplements that the federal government is providing for us. And with that, I will pass it off to uh, Robert Del Rosario. All right. Thanks, Chris. Robert Del Rosario, Director of Service Development and Planning. And um, as stated earlier, I am. Uh, I did attend Cal. Um, I don't want to say how long ago because I think many of you probably were not born yet. So that makes me sad a little bit. Um, but I do want to talk about uh, um, uh, service planning. And I know that's uh, an important thing for, um, for many of the people listening on the call. And it's really taking the information that uh, Derek and Chris provided on us uh, riding safely and our finances and how that translates into service going forward. So I just wanna give you a, a lay of the land of where we are right now. Um, we're currently operating 75% service levels uh, throughout the district and we have 40% of our ridership um, when looking at year over year comparisons. Um, that's pretty low, um, but when you look at the Bay Area, I think we're number two in terms of the amount of riders we're carrying on public transit only second to, uh, to Muni. Um, so what we're planning to do is, is sustain this current level of service. One thing I should also point out when we're, when we're sustaining this current level of service, there are definitely certain areas that have more, um, more ridership demand than others and, and Berkeley and around campus is uh, one of those areas. So you'll see um, how much service we're actually providing compared to pre-pandemic in, in the upcoming slides. Um, but we are gonna try to uh, sustain these current service levels. I know there was a lot of talk about uh, uh, service reductions uh, with AC Transit, but everything moves so quickly with the pandemic. And so um, if, you, if you were to ask us a year ago um, or nine months ago uh, where we were going to be, um, it was really a big question mark and there was a lot of fear about, you know, how are we going to get uh, dollars? But I think Chris nicely laid out uh, where we can get some revenues and hopefully then start to, to grow back service. Um, so we'll continue to do that in, in, in small increments coming up here as resources allow. Uh, the main thing is in August, we want to bring back our school service. This isn't necessarily for Cal students, but more for um, high school and secondary um, um, uh, school students who should be going back to school um, in the fall. And then we'll try to just keep fixing the service and, and, and right-sizing it uh, to make sure that we're addressing the needs, especially as traffic comes back or as demand comes back, we want to be able to be responsive to that. Um, but the main thing is that we, we want to look at what the network is going to look like um, post-pandemic. And um, we really need to have an understanding of what ridership patterns will be. I think Chris had mentioned that, um, you know, who knows what, what trans-based service is going to be. And that was a big piece of our, or an important piece of our service. Um, but do we bring back as much trans-based service as we have in the past? Um, we also have to just make sure that we have resources. It's, it's one thing to reduce service um, and, and, and reduce our workforce um, and, and, uh, and, and try to right size to what we can afford. It's another thing to start growing service. Um, and growing service means we have to get more resources, more hiring, uh, more of our systems in place to, to get back to, to pre-pandemic service levels. And that's, that's a lot more difficult, um, but we, we are excited to, to try to get to that point. Um, and along the way, we're gonna make sure that we do very good public outreach, uh, such as this meeting and future meetings, uh, to really hear from the public uh, what your needs are um, riding as we get into uh, pandemic recovery. Um, and finally, there is this effort that I'll talk about a little bit more about um, um, uh, coordination at the regional level. And so making sure that you can only, you not only can travel in AC transit, but also in other, other transit systems uh, um, um, uh, with better connectivity uh, between transit agencies. And so that you're not having, um, you know, awkward transfers say between AC transit and Muni or AC transit and BART. Uh, next slide. So here's an idea of, of what our service looks like um, around campus right now. So these are all the routes that, that touch campus um, and you can see from on a weekday uh, service level, a lot of the service is the same from um, pre-pandemic to what we have today. Uh, we really tried to, to focus our um, service increases and restoration on where the, the services needed most. And you'll see that some of the hill routes are where we have uh, less, uh, less service, but a lot of our, um, our, our, our um, heavy haul routes like the 51B, um, and, uh, and the F line, those are all pretty much um, back to pre-pandemic service levels because we know we want to meet the ridership. Um, next slide. Looking at uh, weekends, 
Um, again, the Hill service is where we have low demand. And, the, and so those services haven't quite returned yet. Um, we're going to do some planning to figure out when we can return those services and what those services will look like in the future. Um, but for the most part, we do have a lot of our, our services um, back for, um, for weekends. Um, and again, you know, Cal is in one of those locations where it's just dense, uh, uh, dense um, uh, residential um, student activity as well as uh, commercial activity. And so we wanna make sure we provide the right services. Next slide. So going forward, um, and, and I talked about building a new network. Um, though we're going to do these incremental uh, uh, service increases along the way as resources allow, um, we do wanna build a new network. Um, and, 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 and figure out what are those ridership patterns that we want to address post-pandemic. We know that it's going to be different than pre-pandemic. People are going to be riding transit differently. Um, we're going to focus on the essential trips. Uh, Director Walsh had talked about um, um, making sure that we, pr we provide service at an equitable um, level and making sure we serve our communities who need transit most and need transportation most because they have no other modes. And so those are all the things that we want to take into consideration. And so the first thing we want to do is, is, is hear from the public. We're going to start these transit talks in, um, in uh, uh, coming up uh, next month or the next few weeks. Um, and these will be by ward. And we want to hear from the public about what are their needs um, and also give uh, the public some idea of some of the initiatives that we have um, in mind uh, with regards to our service. Um, and then we'll start uh, taking that input um, and doing more uh, outreach getting more feedback, um, and then we can start putting together some plans. Um, once we have a plan together, hopefully by the end of this calendar year, we can then go through our formal public uh, hearing process, which uh, allows the public to uh, provide feedback on any uh, service change proposals. So hopefully we'll have a new network in place um, when all is said and done. Um, after this robust outreach and different phases of outreach, we can then implement in the fall of 2022. But again, that doesn't mean that we're not doing restoration uh, incrementally um, in between them. We are going to try to piece back services, but we just wanna make sure we have the right network uh, once we're back to a more permanent situation. Next slide. So in addition to the service, um, there's also, what can we do to bring back service better? Um, and there's lots of initiatives that the region's going through, AC Transit's going through um, to really try to return service um, better than it was before and, and give people a better riding experience. So some of those are transit priority improvements. Um, looking at the Bay Bridge, you can see that photo in the lower left corner there. That was a, a shoulder um, going up to the toll plaza um, that was converted to a transit lane. Uh, so we're gonna look at more ideas like that. Um, and then um, the, the, you're probably familiar with the, the photo in the upper left corner. Um, that's the dedicated transit lane that was put in a few years ago on Bancroft. We're looking at more of that around campus. Can we do one on Durant? Um, um, what are the other locations in Berkeley and the region? Where we can do uh, projects that are more quicker and uh, more quickly in nature, and also um, uh, have have a good amount of effectiveness for a pretty cheap cost. Um, so, so we're we're looking at capital improvements to really get that bus going uh, more uh, more quickly um, and also more reliably. Um, we're then looking at regional coordination. As I mentioned, there's a big effort in the region to figure out how we can make those uh, those uh, connections work between us and other transit agencies. I think a big piece of that is fares and making sure that our fare. Our fares are, um, are um, um, uniform uh, uh, throughout and we can make transfers uh, more uh, easily between uh, different agencies. Also getting around, I think I saw a, 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 a question in the chat about um, um, signage of getting on the bus. I think that's a key piece as well as signage to just get around um, the, uh, the, the network and between different transit agencies. Um, the last thing I wanna talk about is um, our zero emission bus program. And so again, how are we going to return? Um, um, can we return not only as a better transit agency, but also as a cleaner transit agency, um, addressing greenhouse gas emissions uh, concerns and meeting those targets in the future? And so we have a very strong uh, zero emission bus program. Um, it began in 2000 with our hydrogen fuel cell uh, program. We have now 26 active zero emission buses, but we have many more coming on the way. I believe we have 43 coming up um, uh, um, into our fleets in the next year. And then what we're trying to do is compare, really compare hydrogen fuel cell, battery electric, hybrid, diesel, and really figure out what's the best technology. And that's what that five by five technology assessment is. It's taking five buses of hydrogen fuel cell, five buses of battery electric, and even five buses of our, of our older fleet and seeing how the, how the, 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 the different um, technology types perform against each other. And then we can move forward with what that project um, or what that uh, fleet should look like in the future. Um, and this is all required by the state of California for us to, um, 
to uh, meet their, their mandates for having a zero emission fleet in the future. The one thing I also want to point out back to transit priority improvements is that there is a bill um, for um, looking at the Bay Bridge. Um, it is, uh, let's see, Assembly Bill 455. It was introduced by, uh, by Assemblymember Bonta, who is now the Attorney General uh, for the state, which is exciting. Um, but it aims to enhance transit service into and out of San Francisco along the Bay Bridge. And the big key to that is that there's a possibility for a dedicated transit lane on the Bay Bridge, which would be tremendous benefit for trans Bay riders um, and for those folks in Cal needing to go to San Francisco. So there's a lot on the horizon in terms of service, but there's also a lot on the horizon in terms of infrastructure and capital improvements um, where we wanna to try to come back better than we have before. And I think that concludes everything. Next slide. And I will pause there and we can take uh, or turn it back to um, David um, and see if we have any questions. Thank you. Thank you all for, for the wonderful updates with what's going on, uh, not only for the campus, but also uh, across the region. And it's important to make sure that we've got everything lined up and uh, you know we're happy to be, to continue the partnership and to continue the legacy that uh, Robert first started. Um, so we're gonna start with a couple of questions here. Um, and I think uh, we'll start with Jordan's question. Um, what are the plans to increase uh, service frequency across the East Bay? Are there ballot measures or and or new taxes in the works that could help beef up service? Um, maybe someone from LA, uh, from, from the legislative team can talk about the potential ballot measures and then I can talk about the, the service planning. Hello, <clears throat> hello. this is Beverly Green. I'm the Executive Director of External Affairs, Marketing and Communications. And as you can imagine, right now in the time of this changing economy, we are looking at um, all kinds of ways to bring additional revenue in. Um, so that is one thing that staff is looking at. We have not taken that to the board at this time. Uh, there are measures being considered for uh, other organizations, regional measures for 2024, um, but there's there's a lot of looking at 22 and 24. Nothing has been approved at this time. Thanks, Beverly. And then on the service side, it's 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 a similar story where we're going through the um, the collection of uh, public inputs, um, and then we'll bring that back uh, to to the board for approval. But some of the things that we're looking at. Um, um, one is we want to make sure that we bring back our service where the riders um, need the service the most. Um, and we, we, we've done a lot of that already with uh, bringing back all of our trunk line service to pre-pandemic levels. Um, but we want to make an assessment of where else we need to, to, to bring back that service. And I showed earlier in that slide that we, we have less service coming from the hills. Um, well, the hills, you know, the, the ridership demand is, is less. I mean, those buses still get crowded. I know the 65 um, um, definitely gets crowded around peak times. Um, but overall, if you compare that route, say, to the 18 or to the 72 or the 51B, that's really where we want to concentrate our, our, our resources and return. <clears throat> and then we just have to really see what ridership patterns are like, um, make sure that we serve disadvantaged communities um, um, better than we have in the past. Um, and then really, I think the, the, the big nut to crack is, is how are we going to address trans-based service and what that's going to look like in the future. Wonderful, thank you. Uh, for our participants, our audience that are on uh, today's meeting, uh, if you have additional questions, please use the chat. Uh, we'll go one by one and we'll make sure that all of those answers are uh, see fit and answered. Uh, so thank you very much, Robert. Uh, next question is coming from Kenji uh, toward uh, for Gene Walsh. Um, assuming that you're not too burned out from fighting the NIMBYs over the International Boulevard uh, BRT line, which uh, feature tempo lines are coming up next? If you could uh, describe that. Yeah, so uh, that was a big learning experience from what I can tell doing the BRT. It was a big project. It, it, there were a lot of lessons learned. It was a hard project to do. AC Transit had not ever done a project like this before. So I think we're going to have to look at, you know, how do we do a project like this going forward? Is AC Transit the right agency to do it? Perhaps it's AC PC, which is what I think we're leaning towards, a different entity that could manage all the different jurisdictional moves that have to, to happen for a project like that, that goes through a lot of different cities. So I, I think there's a lot of interest in something perhaps along San Pablo, 
maybe it won't be a BRT in the sense of nice stations and you know like the, the full BRT experience, but maybe some dedicated lanes, maybe a faster, smoother experience along San Pablo is, is a potential. And I'll, I'll, I'll let staff kind of chime in. I see Robert with his head um, nodding. So maybe you have some ideas of where we could do this next. And you covered that very well. Um, so yeah, San Pablo is the, is the, the targeted um, corridor to look at next by the Alameda County Transportation Commission. So um, the, the county has some interest in San Pablo and also working with Contra Costa County. Uh, to figure out uh, both near-term improvements, as Director Walsh mentioned, and potentially long-term improvements that are, are similar to, to Tempo. Um, the other corridor is uh, East 14th Mission, so going further south into um, San Leandro, Hayward, and then into uh, Fremont, um, potentially an extension of the Tempo line down in San Leandro. Um, so, so those seem to be the two uh, focus areas uh, for us, and, and I think Director Walsh really mentioned a key point that maybe the way to deliver these projects quicker and more effectively is to not have AC Transit be the sole sponsor, but to really look at the county and folks who own the streets and own the right of way. We're an operator on those streets. We don't own those streets. And so looking at someone else to, to help us with that, I think is a nice model to look at going forward. Thank you. Uh, so I'm gonna put the next question uh, towards Derek. Um, if there are plans to increase bus riders uh, post June 15th, uh, given the announcement from the Department of Public Health that California will quote unquote, reopen after June 15th. So everything in regards to that, I mean, we have to, we follow CDC guidelines with the uh, capacity. Um, we uh, did uh, hear of the changes that are gonna supposedly take place on the 15th. So we're gonna comply with the, whatever, is in, whatever is in place, but we're first, we first have to adhere to CDC requirements. Um, so once we do that, uh, then we'll roll out a plan to make sure that everybody understands that, you know, we'll be at full capacity and we'll be able to uh, operate our service as normal. But, you know, we just wanna make sure that we're throwing caution to the wind, but we will follow um, that guidance as we did with the COVID-19 as well. Thank you, and one minor follow-up for you, sir. Um, what, uh, could you uh, reiterate what the current uh, capacities are for um, existing uh, buses right now? Sure, so the buses that, um, you know, actually probably most of the folks ride on here are 40 uh, foot coaches, uh, only can take 10 passengers. Um, our 60 foot uh, larger, our ticks can, take 16. And, uh, you know, we don't uh, drive our double deckers in that area. Uh, they take 24 and our 45 uh, foot uh, MCIs take, uh, take 12 passengers. Thank you very much. Uh, that, that's very helpful. Um, I believe we kind of answered the, um, the clear signs for all boarding riders uh, for the 6 and 51B. Uh, could we have an quick overview of what was done um, to help promote that along both of those lines, uh, seeing how both of those, both the six and the 51B are major lines that our students use. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. This is Michelle Lanes, uh, Acting Director of Marketing Communications. So we did a number of um, promotional activities to get the word out about the all door boarding pilot. It is a pilot. Um, we are tracking uh, the usage with an eye toward reporting back to the board of directors on the, on the stats of usage and what challenges we might have faced in the deployment of the pilot. We promoted the pilot through our e -news e subscription service on social media directly to 6 and 51B riders. We had extensive uh, communications on our social media channels, um, which are uh, Facebook, Instagram, um, and uh, Twitter. We also obviously promoted on our website with a comprehensive uh, web page. And we, um, on the buses themselves, we note that rear door boarding is uh, in effect. 
We notified on the front of the bus at the fare box that, hey, if you have a clipper card, you should go to the back of the bus and tag. And, and we also had that information on the back of the bus. So, um, and we noted on the outside of all of those coaches that these, these coaches are available for rear door boarding. Um, and finally, we noted at the bus stops for the six and the 51B riders, we did, we put up temporary signage alerting riders to board on the rear of the bus um, if they're riding the six and the 51B lines. Thank you very much. Um, so we have a uh, financial question and uh, from, uh, from our committee member, Sam Taplin. Uh, has federal aid completely compensated for revenues lost because of the pandemic? Uh, not necessarily completely, but it has come very close. Um, we, since we reduced service, we, uh, our expenses have gone down a little bit also. Um, so it, you know, we, we have had enough revenues to be able to meet the uh, expenses that we have for the service that we have. So um, it's been very close, uh, I would say. All right, thank you. Um, Garrett had asked this question um, in, in terms of uh, the board, you know, uh, how does the fact that the uh, AC Transit Board is directly elected um, and does that change how you interact with them? Um, have you ever felt like you have had to pander or promise too much only to uh, feel like you've under, under delivered? Who is this question for? <laughs> I, I would say that would be a, a Gene Walsh question. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Uh... One, one, a couple interesting things about the board of directors that one thing I forgot to mention, the AC Transit Board is majority woman run. There's four women on the board, which is really unusual. The other thing that's unusual is that it's one of three elected boards in the country. Correct me if I'm wrong. BART, RTD in, in Denver, and also AC Transit. The other transit boards are appointed. You know, they'll, they'll appoint a mayor, appoint a city council member. So the, it's a very unique system that we have here. I don't know how it compares to other uh, organizations because I haven't I haven't been on the board of any other organization. But I do know that as a you know first time candidate running, um, I had a lot of things that I wanted to do, and I still have a lot of things. I have a big vision that I want to accomplish. Once you get into office, uh, you know you have to work with the other board members and the staff, and so my ideas are only going to go as far as I can get support from the other board members. And so what I'm learning as a new elected official is, you know, your ideas only go so far. If you don't have other support of the board members, you're not going to be able to make change. So I'm, you know, it's not a one person show. It's a seven member board and we all have to work together to make decisions. And so, you know, I tried to, you know, speaking for myself, I tried to be careful when I was campaigning to not promise things that I couldn't deliver because, you know, I don't know, for example, if we can accomplish free fares, you know, I, I don't know enough about the revenue, the sources of revenue. I, I wasn't going to say that I was going to accomplish that. Um, so I tried to sort of be, you know, realistic, but also visionary. Um, and so, so that, that's just speaking from my, my personal experience. I don't know if that's answering your question. Um, but that, that's what I would have to say. And, and I don't know if someone maybe Beverly or someone from AC Traffic about what from the I think that what having a directed elected board does is board. actually make the um, the board member and the organization overall much more sensitive to the constituents. I think that is actually a big advantage of what we have as being a directly elected board. Our board is very, very accessible to the public. I mean, as you know, you can send an email to Jean Walsh and she will respond to you. So that's one of the big benefits that you have of having a directly elected board. Right on, thank you very much. Um, so we have a pair of questions. Um, uh, and Robert, I, I will direct uh, that attention to you, sir. Um, so it's kind of a paired question. Are there plans to revive daytime service uh, to the Alta Bates uh, area along Ashby, whether it be in the form of Route 80 or in the form of a new bus line. Uh, in the same vein, 
Uh, are there plans to return weekend service on the 79? Sure, sure, I can definitely answer that. And that, that literally hits close to home because I'm a block away from a 79 stop. So I wanna see some weekend service come back on the 79 as well. Um, so with regards to uh, uh, line 80, um, we've, we've seen that there's a, a, a survey or a petition going out about re returning that line um, and lots of inquiries to AC Transit as well as to the cities and to, to I'm sure Cal officials. Um, the, the challenge is that um, the ridership was pretty low on line 80. So I know it makes great connections. Um, it travels along Ashby and Ashby is a key uh, east-west spine um, and then heads up towards um, uh, along West Berkeley up towards El Cerrito. Um, so what we're going to do is look at uh, the segments of line 80 and, and think about those in the new network um, and how they fit in. Uh, we've had service along both of these segments um, historically for, for quite some time. Um, but maybe that's not the way to, to, to correctly piece together the, the service so that it's productive. Um, and like I said earlier, you know, we're really focusing on where the riders are the most um, uh, uh, and have the most demand. And so those are our, our trunk lines. And you know, Chris had mentioned that we're, we're, we're close to balancing a budget, but imagine we're close to balancing a budget that we're at 75% of service levels. Um, so, so we do need to make sure that we have sustainable uh, sources of funding so that we can increase more of our coverage service um, and have that be permanent. The last thing we want to do is add something and then and then take it away. The story is about the same for the for the 79. Um, we know that there's some weekday demand, um, especially as schools uh, uh, return. Um, but in terms of a weekend demand, the 79 is a good feeder into downtown Berkeley um, and to campus. Um, but it does come from pretty low uh, uh, density neighborhoods on the on the northern end. Um, and also, you know, around the, um, the, the Elmwood area. Um, it's a good service. Um, it actually exceeded our expectations pre-pandemic, um, but, you know, relative to the, the, the bigger picture that we have to figure out where we get the most bang for our buck, it's, it's, it's something that we have to look at when we look at our network plan for next year. Terrific, thank you. Um, so we had a longtime transit user ask this question about the, uh, the metrics behind uh, regional integration and all door boarding. Um, what will determine the all door boarding successes, especially when it comes to dwell times, uh, as well as connecting with BART, as well as you know cascading to other agencies and their connectivity? I can, uh, I can take that. We actually have our project manager for the um, all door boarding um, um, pilot. Um, we think this is actually going to be great for, um, for, for service, also in this new normal uh, that we're thinking about um, and having less you know, um, close interactions say between operator and passengers. So all door boarding solves that safety issue, but also solves that dwell time issue. And I think the key piece is, is, is that's the key performance metric there is how, how much can we minimize dwell time to increase the speed of the bus. But even if we don't um, get um, um, substantial results or significant results from that, going through the back door and having the, 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 the circulation in the bus um, um, speed up, um, I think just even from a perspective of riding the bus, um, it's a big improvement. Um, and I think MTC, the Metropolitan Transportation Commission, so they're the ones responsible for Clipper um, in the region, they see that as well. And so, um, um, you know, we can turn to, to SFMTA as um, their model for success. And then we can look at these two routes and see how these will perform. But I would say that um, as a region, uh, there is a, pu a push to have um, all door boarding um, go out system wide wherever it transit agencies can do it. Terrific, thank you. Uh, Intrepid intern Blair Zhang has this question. It's uh, for transit and uh, uh, operations and for planning. Yes, so thank you so much for coming today, first of all, and sharing us with the information about the future plans of PC Transit and relationship to the campus. My question is kind of based on the observation that AC Transit is expecting a lower ridership on Transbay and other commuter routes because of the shift to work from home. And so uh, would it be correct to say that those would be excess or spare bus capacities that could be potentially relocated, uh, especially to the campus routes where there have been historically a loss of crowding on like 51B, 52 during the peak hours. Uh, given that students are returning to the campus in the fall, 
uh, would there be a possible plan to you know reallocate those extra buses and uh, operators to service the campus with more frequency? It's a, it's a great question. Um, so, so one thing to point out is that we're at 75% uh, service levels and that's pretty much what we can afford right now. Um, and so there isn't really this excess capacity. We have a little bit of excess capacity that we're using for um, um, pass ups and overcrowding, which I know is a big issue um, on our trunk line. So we try to double up the 72, for example, and also the temple line is, a, is another big one. Um, but, but we don't necessarily have the resources um, for Trans Bay to use somewhere else that we just can't afford right now. As more dollars come in, um, that may be a possibility. And that's where I, I, I looked at, um, or I mentioned um, um, looking at what future ridership patterns will be. You know, the one thing with, with Trans Bay that's interesting is that um, I think the mode split for the bridge for um, public transit versus car is like 50%, 50% ride BART, this is all pre-pandemic, 50% ride BART, um, AC transit or some other means of, uh, of uh, public transit, um, Westcat, Soul Trans, um, and then 50% drive. So even if there is a big push for work from home, I think there's still going to be um, riders that we can capture on the Bay Bridge. And I still think that traffic is gonna come back pretty horribly um, on the Bay Bridge, it's already happening. And so we need to make sure we monitor that. And we just have to do a better job, right? Of getting people to, to uh, ride Trans Bay. It may not be the uh, you know, wealthy $150,000 salary employee, but it could be another group of, of uh, people that are gonna ride over, over to uh, San Francisco that we have to accommodate for. So I think there is still enough um, um, potential there on Trans Bay that it will come back in some form. Um, and then you know, the main thing to get capacity improved, I think Derek mentioned it, is we gotta get more people on the bus. Um, and so the pandemic has to end and then we get more people on the bus and then we'll, we'll be able to, to, to meet demand. And this is gonna be a slow, the, the impacts of the pandemic are gonna be a very long, prolonged period of time. So we're gonna to try to grow commensurate with how things return. Now to Erica. Yes, uh, my question is, has there been any federal, state, regional grants other than the CARES Act available to help alleviate the loss of fare box revenue? Uh, hi, I'll, I'll take this one, uh, Erica. Uh, there, there hasn't been directly. Um, there is, a, I believe, a bill that's being proposed in Congress now um, that would be, you know, would be available to people to do, uh, you know, sort of free fares or to reduce fares, but uh, it hasn't passed yet. It hasn't, you know, actually become a, a real thing. Um, but there haven't, there hasn't really been any specific money to, you know, just for fare box or just to reduce fares, things like that. Thank you. And another question from Jordan is that if we manage to raise the revenue uh, to run AC Transit fare free, roughly how much time would that save or how much money would that occur and how much better could uh, this help uh, bus headways? Yeah, Jordan's coming with the $100,000 questions. Really appreciate it. Um, so, so a good example to, to look at is, um, is the Temple BRT line. Um, and so that, um, that basically would cut dwell in half. Um, and you look at what happened there. Um, we had 10 minute frequency there now. We had a uh, uh, 10, uh, 10 minute frequency there before, but our on-time performance, the one was, was horrible, right? It came every you know, three buses at a time. It came, uh, I think our on-time performance on the one was somewhere around like 60% or so. Now on the tempo, um, you know, Derek's doing a great job of managing the service out there. We're close to 80% on time performance, which is about where you max out with bus transit. Um, so I think that the first thing that fare free will do is really get us to be more reliable and consistent um, because I think that's a big variable. And then um, I'm getting um, um, information in my ear that it's about 25% of the travel time is a result of dwell time. So if we cut that in half, then we have a, a, a decent improvement there. Um, whether or not it, it, it translates into, um, into more service remains to be seen. Um, what we do is we piece together all of our routes um, in a scheduler, a big schedule software. And so hopefully if we start to um, 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 speed up the travel times because of left all time, then you can piece more things together and get the efficiencies that way. So, so yeah, fingers crossed, um, um, but, but that's sort of the information we know right now preliminarily. 
Thank you. And uh, I believe this would be the last question since uh, I don't see any others. Um, I guess in terms of the 51B being, uh, you know, over capacity at times, crowding, um, you get pass ups. Any uh, ideas or plans to expand capacity, whether it be uh, the use of 60 foot buses, uh, you know, decreasing frequency down to less than 10 minutes or things along that uh, nature? Yeah, um, it's definitely um, a, a possibility. So the larger buses, the articulated buses um, aren't possible. If you look at the length of bus stops along College Avenue, it's just, they're, they're short, right? They're short for 40 foot buses. And I'm sure many of us have, um, have gotten um, on and off the bus on College Ave in the middle of the street um, when the bus is stopped in, in, in traffic. Um, so, so I think one thing that we have to improve first is the spacing of the buses um, on the 51B. Um, get through the Ashby intersection better and that that I think that three or four blocks right there because um, that really that really makes the buses bunch up and when they bunch up then you end up having just one bus coming every um, every 30 minutes as opposed to a bus every 10 minutes so that's one thing we have to to, to fix and then I think as Derek mentioned we got to get our capacity limits back um, and get that um, and, and we can board more people um, and I think that's our biggest solution right now for for, for pass ups and then, you know, I think we can do some capital improvements. I mentioned those quick build type of improvements. Um, um, I saw someone was uh, excited about potentially Durant. Um, we've all seen the lane on Bancroft. And we put those in. Lots of uh, people were really worried. Look at the outcome. It's fine, right? The, the, the lanes work great. Um, no one, you know, no, no uh, one was negatively affected. So we got to demonstrate that we can do more of that in the more critical areas, um, particularly along College Avenue. And I wanted to just piggyback on what uh, Robert said and you know, when I was looking at the comment about the 51B, you know, our operations control center and our road supervisors do an excellent job of trying to monitor uh, bus bunching. And one of the big things that we try to do, um, especially uh, when we have overcrowding is our operators are calling in and uh, notifying us to see that they're getting close to overcrowding. We have what we call shadow buses that uh, we can relay out to come out and uh, pick up passengers. So. We don't have a huge uh, capacity uh, to be able to do that, but we try to do that in every instance uh, to minimize uh, passing up uh, passengers. And then we have way now for the operators to communicate with OCC on how many passengers that they're potentially passing up so that we uh, jump on it as quickly as possible. So I wanna make sure that you know that we're doing everything possible to not pass up passengers, but the capacity is just a, a complete issue with AC Transit that we're trying to work through. Thank you. Um, Madeline has a question. Uh, she was, she's also on our, uh, they are also in, in our group. Um, is AC Transit tracking safety incidents or taking steps to ensure passenger safety uh, given lower ridership and fewer people on the street? Yeah, I can answer that question. Uh, continuously, we are monitoring incidents and looking at, uh, you know, hot spots when we do have issues. And fortunately, uh, we've had uh, a lot of uh, the issues with assaults and other things that have taken place pre-pandemic that have actually really reduced. Um, we've uh, increased our ALCO presence uh, on at least the BRT line. Uh, we have, uh, you know, two ALCO sheriffs that actually go down and monitor the BRT line. So we've, uh, We've looked at, uh, looked at it closely um, to make sure that we don't have anything that uh, potentially uh, can increase. But again, for the most part, uh, we've seen a reduction, you know, over this, uh, this pandemic. And, uh, you know, the operators are really aware and they uh, communicate very quickly with uh, any issues that uh, can go on out there, as well as our road supervisors. So hopefully that answers your question. Thank you very much. Um, and then I believe this is the last one. Um, and uh, if we could basically just get an understanding of uh, with reduced capacity and the pass ups, uh, what services are available uh, to let the public know of the status of the bus is full or not in real time? I will take that question. I am excited. I'm, uh, Director Walsh told me I was faceless the last go around, so I'll be on screen this time. Uh, Michelle, again, Michelle Lanes. So we have um, we have a product on our website called ACT Real Time. It is our real time bus 
arrival system. And our uh, innovation and technology team partnered with uh, operations, transportation, planning, uh, marketing, communications to ensure that um, we had a method uh, to inform our riders about the capacity limits. So we call this particular feature rider capacity feature. There is, I wish we had included a little screenshot on screen in our presentation deck, but there are are little icons if you look on ACT real time and you can get that both from AC Transit and on um, third party partners like Transit and Google Transit, you'll see some icons that identify whether the bus is crowded or not crowded um, or at capacity. And you can just tell from visual a visual quick look on ACT real time, you'll see that even in colors. Um, orange, uh, yellow, green, red to identify, um, to identify, you can just look at it really quickly visually. So we have that for 80% of the bus lines, every bus line that we have, what we call automatic passenger counters, APCs, we are able to um, provide that feature to our riders. And we're working on uh, making that 100%. We'll be doing that real time. I think uh, the process right now for securing additional equipment to get ourselves to 100% is happening now. Fantastic. Thank you all. Um, yeah, the, the writer capacity feature is a major uh, tool uh, and a very helpful tool to make sure that, you know, your buses are coming, but also helpful are they uh, so that you can help plan your trip a little better. Um, Above all else, I want to thank the staff at AC Transit for being here tonight. I am extremely appreciative, as is the the entire uh, committee of class pass um, and that, you know, we hope that, you know, we will continue uh, working towards uh, getting service on the road and, as well as, you know, serving the public to the best of our abilities. Um, and I also would want to thank our uh, class pass committee of students, uh, both for the ASUC, the graduate assembly, and then just students at large who uh, wanted to actually take the time to understand and make transit better for the students for years to come. And, uh, you know, this is a very, very exciting time. And we hope that, you know, we will be able to do this again uh, in the future. So thank you guys very much. And, um, you know, we hope that you guys uh, remain safe and uh, have a pleasant, uh, you know, rest of the semester. And we'll talk soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you.